there is a real potential here that we could test that 200 day moving average, which would be exactly a 50% retracement of the previous rally. That would be completely normal as well, nothing to fear. And that put us back at about 4690. So say 4,700 by the time that we get there. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, you've got another, you know, two, 300 points of downside. That's not, you know, that's not nothing, right? So, you know, you should certainly hedge some risk here, but be careful kind of panic selling this market, getting too bearish. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm Thoughtful Money founder and your host, Adam Taggart, welcoming you back here at the end of another week in the markets. Uh, pretty interesting week. We're joined as usual by my equanimous friend, Lance Roberts, portfolio manager from RIA. How you doing, Lance? I'm good. Uh, you're going to eventually run out of small dinosaurs. So, you know. It's hard. They're, they're going extinct pretty fast. It takes me <laughs> longer and longer to come up with a word. So equanimous um, is the adjective form of equanimity, which means mental calmness, composure, and evenness of temper, especially in a difficult situation. And I think we need a lot of equanimity this week because Lance, uh, the day we're speaking, uh, at least briefly, the S&P broke below uh, 5,000. Uh, mm -hmm. We had Israel uh, retaliate against Iran for retaliating against Israel, uh, but uh, Israel actually uh, blew some drones into actual um, Iranian soil. Um, we also uh, have a new Taylor Swift double album that launched today. So look, Lance, has the end of days arrived? <laughs> well, you know, first of all, you know, if you know, I, I'm kind of embarrassed for Israel. I mean, I know I know why they did it, but you know, when I used to fight back in the day, um, you know, you'd always have this this opponent that would always kind of strike fear in your heart a bit, right? And so I always dreaded those fights when I had to go into them. And it was always interesting because more than once I would go into that fight and it would be such an easy fight. I, I just like, I, I was like, you know, I was so worried about this and it turned out to, about, not to be the case. And it was kind of the case for, for Israel. They shot off these drones. And it was like, here, I'm just going to show you, I can send some stuff your way, but we're really not meaning it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, for folks that didn't see, um, I issued a special report earlier this week, um, a video with uh, Ryan Bowl from Rain Network, which um, is one of the top geopolitical consultancies in the world. They actually, not that long ago, acquired Stratfor, which is a name a lot of people are familiar yeah. with. Um, and Ryan is their um, Middle East uh, specialist. And so um, if you're trying to understand kind of the roots of what's going on right now between Israel and, and, and Iran, um, I thought that was a fantastic discussion. Ryan did a really good job of laying out just sort of the whole background context, the facts, the pros and cons of each side's positions, um, trying, I think, to be, I think he did a great job being sort of as unbiased uh, and nonpartisan as possible um, about a very sticky, very emotionally charged topic. But he basically said, um, he, he predicted that Israel was going to have to do something, um, but he predicted that it was going to be... Um, uh, as, as moderate as they could make it, uh, because really both sides don't have an interest, a strategic interest yeah. in escalating this thing into a full-blown kinetic war. So there's a lot of political posturing that they have to do to make their, you know, each, yeah. each well, of their constituencies know that they're not pushovers. Right. And this is exactly what you and I talked about last Friday when this is kicking off. I, I said, I said, both sides have to puff up their chest and, you know, they got to pound the table and, and do all this. But at the end of the day, nobody's got an appetite for a kinetic conflict. Right. And, and, and especially kind of the traditional backers of both sides. Right. So the Americans have basically been telling uh, Israel, look, dudes, like we're, we'll, we'll, we'll keep defending you, but we're not going to support you know, right. a, 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 an offensive maneuver. And I think, you know, it sounds like Russia is saying very similar things to Iran, which is, hey, we're kind of embroiled in Ukraine right now. And we actually have, we've got a lot of ties to Israel, you know, culturally. And so, you know, don't don't let this thing go bananas, right? And then look, it's, it's, it's not in anybody's, you know, best interest. You know, look, and, and this goes back, you know, look, I was, I was actually talking about this the other day as uh, on the radio show saying, you know, Yes, we've been in world wars before and we were in World War One. We were in World War Two and we know how those things turn out and we know how devastating those things can be. And it's really is ultimately the last choice 
that anybody wants because while it may be great economically long term, right? Because you got to rebuild everything, the destruction process, the loss of life, all that is is is, is something that is not popular <laughs> with countries that are in the middle of that. So you know, and this is what we're saying last week is that everybody's got to posture themselves. Everybody's, you know, nobody can, can, can kind of roll over and be the, you know, okay, fine, you did it. I'm not going to retaliate. They can't do that. But at the same time, nobody really wants to go to that next step of this. And, and I'm not saying that it can't happen. We've been in world wars before, but there's not a huge amount of appetite for that for many government. I don't think so, but, but I would say that there's, there's not a lot of appetite, especially in the U S for even the initial steps along the way to that, right? So, you know, in, in the conversation with Ryan, we sort of talked about the, the military capabilities of both sides. And he basically said, look, you know, Israel's the nuclear power here, and they do have a they do have a, a bigger war machine, a more effective war machine than Iran. But he said, but what Iran can do is it can make the rest of the world feel pain by, you know, curtailing uh key shipments, especially oil through the parts yeah, of the Gulf. See, the I, I, I disagree with that because, you know, in the U.S. now, we, we yes, we still import some oil, right? But we have so much production of oil in the U.S. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that Doomberg was even talking about this previously in that interview he did with you. We have enough energy and capability to, to create oil here in, in the United States to be completely energy independent. We don't need oil from Iran you know, specifically, I mean, we'd have to change policy in Washington right now, but there's plenty of reserves in the U.S. to fulfill all of our own oil needs. Yeah, I, I think in the in the big picture, I, I think, yes. And, and again, I'm no oil specialist. One, there's all sorts of different, you know, degrees of grades of oil and, and you know, your refining comes into the mix and all that type of stuff. But to your point, to do that would take a lot more time than the current administration has before the election, right? So that's where I'm going, which is they right. don't want anything right now that's going to continue to send the price of oil higher before the election. And so they're right. looking at what's going on right now with rising oil prices and just a general higher risk premium in the world and saying, hey, this is not the time for us <laughs> for that <laughs> right now. So, look, anyways, look, it's, look, I'm just current, underscoring your point, which nobody wants yeah. this thing to keep going. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the current administration has tons of problems right now heading into the election. And so to your point, you're absolutely right. They don't need something else. They've already got enough problem with just you know general approval of the economic condition in the U.S. It's going to be a tough fight at the polls come November. Right. And this is a big, sadly, it's a big one, right? I mean, right yeah. now at the top of the list is normally is the case, but I think especially so now is the economy. You know, in, in, in fact, the, the new buzz line is not, it's the economy stupid, it's inflation stupid. <laughs> So if you see gas prices heading higher into November, that's like kryptonite right now um, right. to this a sitting administration. So, OK, well, look, um, real quick, folks, um, again, if you didn't watch that video with uh, Ryan on the Iran-Israel conflict and are interested in the topic, uh, go watch that uh, soon. It's it's definitely very uh, it's an excellent video. Um, I also just want to remind folks um, for all things thoughtful money related, uh, go to thoughtfulmoney.com. Um, I, I mentioned last week, I mentioned that, that we launched our new macro pass service for our premium newsletter subscribers. Uh, we launched it with Tom McClellan's April um, McClellan market report, which was excellent. This week's, I just want to say, is uh, Kevin Muir's macro tourist report. And, and later on in this discussion with Lance, I'll, I'll get into the details of, of what that report actually dives into. But that, that new macro pass service is out in the world and doing great from initial feedback. Uh, all right. And to sign up for it, obviously, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com, click the newsletter button. Um, all right, Lance. Well, look, um, lots to talk about. Um, I mentioned in the intro that the S&P, at least briefly this morning, uh, on the day Friday that we're filming this, uh, dropped below 5,000. So um, at some point here soon, we might want to bring up uh, the regular S&P charts and just see where we are um, in that, that trend channel break. Um, how uh, I know you're watching all this closely. Um, but but what's it telling? What's it telling you? And how, how important is it that we are flirting with with breaking that sort of psychological big round number of five thousand? Not not nothing really. Uh, you know, again, look, you know, psychologically, there's a lot of you know views on this. Is like you remember when we were going up, you know, to five thousand. We're like, oh, we broke five thousand. So, and, and interestingly enough, the the big round numbers mean more on the way up than they do on the way down. Um, okay. It's just. It's just that's kind of that's just kind of markets 
stupidity, I guess, because it's all over the media, right? It's like, oh, you know, we're going to hit 5,000. And then, of course, you know, whenever you see an analyst come out, they always pick a number like that. It's like the S&P will hit 6,000 by this time next year. It's just a round number and it sounds good. It's like, oh, my God. Probably just because it's it's never been hit before. But once it's, yeah. been, it's like, all right, we've been below yeah. 5,000 before. It's not, yeah. Sure. Not new and, to and us. Again, and again, it means, uh, again, it means a whole lot more on the way up than it does on the way down. Um, you know, if we take, a, you, know, you know, let's go back to what we've been saying, kind of ad nauseum over the last month or so with you, which is as, as we were in this whole big run up, we're saying, look, we're going to get a five to 10 percent correction. Guess what? We're at five percent. So, you know, it's just well, hey, congratulations. You've been saying yeah. that for you know yeah. a couple of months now. Yeah, I know. And, and, and unfortunately, timing is everything. Right. And so. But, you know, it was, you know, it was evident that we were eventually going to have a correction. It was just a function of time. And, and as we said, you know, the, the big issue with that 20 day moving average is that if we take out that 20 day moving average, you're going to convert all of those CTAs, those computerized trading algorithms. They're going to flip from buying the dip to selling the rip. And that's what's been happening. And, and you'll notice that most every day over the last, you know, kind of week, the market was trying to open up and, and we'd open up, you know, 5, 10, 15 points on the S&P and then almost immediately sell off. So every time the market would try to rally, the market would sell off. In fact, doing that again on Friday. So um, we took out the 20, which put the 50 day, which is that black line uh, as next key level of support. We took that out. And so if you look at a Fibonacci retracement, that's the, the shaded kind of color area that we've got on the, on the chart this week. Um, that's a Fibonacci retracement, and I won't go into the whole explanation of the you know the golden ratio and all that. But there's some specific ratios mathematically that typically apply to advances and declines. And we now have sold off to that very first level of that kind of that decline. And that 23.6 percent decline is at 49.93, which is about right where the market was trading uh, Friday morning. So again, this has been a very ordinary. Very low volatility decline, much like we saw in the summer of, of last year. And I'm going to go back and we're going to look at last summer's decline as well. And, you know, but as you look at that bottom part of the graph, we're very oversold. The MACD on the top is getting pretty oversold here. So we're going to get a rally. And, and the question, of course, is, you know, kind of what do you do next in terms of your portfolio? This is not going to be a 20% decline. This is going to be five to 10%, probably somewhere closer to the five. Um, and this will be done. And then we're going to get a rally heading into the summer, uh, potentially. But let's go back and if, we, and if we can take a look at an example of last summer. So, you know, if we go back to um, kind of January, February of last year, the market was kind of struggling coming out of the gate. And then in March, uh, this is where we had the Silicon Valley bank crisis and the market sold off. And then we began this whole AI chase. And you remember, this is was the story last, you know, in November, December, January, February of this year is all about artificial intelligence, right? We had the same rally in March, April, May, June, July of last year. And in fact, in June and July of last year, you and I were sitting right here for two months, just like this time, going, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to get a 5 to 10% correction. I know it doesn't seem like it, but we're going to get a 5 to 10% correction sometime this summer. And the market was doing exactly the same thing. We were hugging the 20-day moving average. And when we took the 20-day moving average out, we broke the 50-day. We headed towards the 100, just as we're doing now. Then we rallied, right? So we got very oversold. The market rallied. And we had a nice rally that took us back to around 4,500 at the time. And got back above the 50-day, got back up to the 20-day, got everybody really excited. And we were like, hey, be careful here. We're not done with this correction yet. And by the end of summer, we completed exactly a 10% decline. Now, I'm not saying we're going to get exactly a 5% or exactly a 10% decline. That's just the range that is normal given any year. And particularly when you have these kind of these accelerated advances, you've got to cool that off so that you can have the next advance, right? You just can't go indefinitely higher forever. We've got to close that deviation that gets between these longer term moving averages. And so there is there's a there's a there is a a real potential opera, you know, I shouldn't say risk because it's not really a risk, but there is a real potential here that we could test that 200 day moving average, which would be exactly a 50 percent retracement of the previous rally. That would be completely normal as well. Nothing to fear. 
And that put us back at about 4690. So f- say 4700 by the time that we get there. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, you've got another, you know, two, 300 points of downside. That's not, you know, that's not nothing, right? So, you know, you should certainly hedge some risk here, but be careful kind of panic selling this market, getting too bearish. Um, there's a lot of stocks. Now I'm going to show you just a couple of stocks as an example. I'm not making recommendations. I'm not saying go buy these things at all, but I'm just, I just want to use Apple as an example because it's a, you know, it's a big popular stock and everybody knows what it is. You know, this stock has already gone from over $200 a share down to 165. It's had a big correction already. So if I'm looking, you know, say I don't own Apple or say that I've been looking to get into Apple, I'm just, again, not making a recommendation. So don't go buy Apple because we're just using it as an example. But if I was looking to get into this stock and I didn't own it, I might be interested to, to start buying it here because it's already had a big correction, yet the market hasn't. Um, you know, if uh, let's say that you missed out on the whole, um, you know, AMD and NVIDIA chase, you know, over the last year, we took profits in NVIDIA and AMD earlier this year. Um, that stock's had a big correction here. So, you know, this is, you know, it's getting fairly decently oversold. If you didn't, you know, you didn't have the, the stock, right, of this previous rally, here's your opportunity to maybe start kind of nibbling into it a bit and, and, and taking advantage of the sell-off in the market. So again, you know, the mistake that people make in investing is they get too tied up in the headlines and they're like, oh my gosh, the market's going to crash. I got to be out of the market. Remember that corrections are opportunities to invest capital at better prices. The mistake that most investors make is, is they want to buy NVIDIA when it's, you know, running straight off to the moon and they want to, and they generally wind up buying it right at the top. And, and as we've always talked about, it's just, hey, be patient, let these things come back to you at a better entry. Again, I'm not making a recommendation to go buy NVIDIA or AMD or anything else, just laying this case out that there are opportunities that can even exist to buy stuff during a correction because that's what corrections are good for. It's like recessions. Recessions are good, right? We, we think they're bad, but recessions are actually good economically. Corrections are great for investors that can take advantage of the opportunity. Okay, great. Um, so do me a favor, go back to the S&P chart for a minute here. Um, so again, first, I just want to underscore the message I think you're trying to make here, which is, um, you know, don't don't necessarily interpret this only 5% so far correction in the market as, uh, you know, this is the great market crash and everything's going to zero here. And of course, anything's possible, but but from a probability standpoint, this is probably more the garden variety, you know, removal of the froth in the market that you've been predicting for a while. And, yeah. uh, you know, stocks don't go down forever and, and look like we're getting pretty oversold here on some of the uh, the RSI and MACD indicators. And so, you know, as you've said, you wouldn't surprise wouldn't surprise you if this was sort of a, you know, a little bit of a corrective washout and then you get better entry points and then we, we go back off to the races here. Yeah, and, and just let me be real, real clear here. I don't think we're done with this correction yet. Sentiment is still too bullish. Positioning is still too bullish. We're only about halfway through that cycle, um, but we're oversold enough short term for a rally. So you know, you can if you haven't taken in advantage of of the previous prices to take profits and rebalance risk, use the rally to do that, and then. Well, like I said, we could continue. This correction could continue a bit longer because we don't have deep negative sentiment yet. We'll likely get there in the next month or so if this continues to go on. But we're working that way. But there is more downside risk. And again, that that hundred day and potentially two hundred day, that's certainly not out of the question. So that's that's part of you know the the management of risk that you need to take advantage of. Okay, um, and, and maybe I'll just cut to the chase here and say um, I, I believe from your perspective. This is a correction inside of a bull market trend, as opposed to we're entering a bear market. I apologize. One, and so so what's important to understand is, is that in, since two thousand and nine, we've been in a bull market, and despite all these corrections that we've had along the way, we've had some doozies. Right, you know, we had thirty five percent back in two thousand and twenty. We had uh, we had the 20 to, uh, 20% correction last year. And remember, everybody was coming out like, oh, it's a bear market. A bear market is not 
a 20% correction. That's kind of a Wall Street arbitrary number. It's not a, it's not a bear market. A bear market is when you reverse the previous bullish trend. So like in 2007, 2008, we completely broke all of the bullish trend that started in, in 2003 through 2007. In, in 2001 and two, that 50% correction broke all the previous trends of that bullish rally from 1995 through 2000. So, you know, what defines a bear market is when you are no longer advancing in price. A bull market is higher prices that are trending higher over a period of time. A bull mar a bear market is when you are no longer trending higher, you're now trending lower. And we've never done that, right? Since 2009, even in that correction that we had in, in 2020, we briefly broke that trend line, but then closed back above it the next month. So it never validated itself. It was just a test of that long-term bullish trend. And so that's where we are. In fact, we're on a monthly buy signal that just flipped going back from the peak of the market in January of 2022. So that that alone, that one signal alone suggests that we could see this bull market continue that we're in right now. Um, now it's going to have corrections, right? We could correct back to that trend line again. That would still be just a correction. But that monthly buy signal suggests that whatever correction we're going to have now is an opportunity to put capital to work because we're in whatever this bullish trend is going to be. It's going to last for probably another couple of years. OK. All right. So that's the main point I was sort of trying to underscore here, which is, you know, what you're not saying. And again, we're only down 5 percent. Right. Yeah. You're not saying this is a run for the hills moment for investors. You're saying it's a hey, just be cautious in the short term. You know, definitely some hedges still might make sense here. But but more or less be positioned for this to bottom at some point and maybe and be have ready some to buy someplace. Yeah. Yeah. And be ready to buy and and have your shopping list ready. Okay. So, and that's what I meant by target. Yeah. Get your shopping yeah, list yeah. ready. Get your shopping list ready of all those companies that you've been wanting to buy and have missed out on opportunities, whatever it is. This is going to be the time to buy them. Okay. So um can you go back to the other S P chart that sure. you had? Um so in, in previous versions of this chart, um, you, you had had kind of that blue channel that, that stocks have been trading in since November. You, you don't have to put that back in if, if, uh, if it's not easy. But um, uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, when you went back historically to the beginning of last year, um, right, right around the, the banking crisis, um, coming out of that, we fortunately for the markets, we had this AI you know, boom, right? This right. this boom in AI mania, right? And that pretty much drove things uh, into, you know, the October correction. Um, then we came out uh, in, in November, which was basically, I think, a recovery. So if you can scroll to November, um, we, we had a recovery off the, the October lows, right. right? And then, right then in early December, right? Right when we'd kind of gotten back up to where the market had peaked out in, in July, then we had the Powell policy pivot, right? That's right. when Powell came out and basically told the markets to expect what it had been asking for all year long, right? Which is, hey, we want we want to know that you're going to pivot. We want to know that rate cuts are coming. And coming into 2024, like the market was expecting, you know, as many as like seven rate cuts in 2024, right? right. So, you know, we had two big narratives, basically is what I'm saying, that drove the action over the past year. One was the AI mania. The second was basically rate cut mania. Um, now it's looking like we're not going to get nearly as many rate cuts as folks initially thought. Um, you know, inflation is is at least the, the the narrative right now is shifting to hey, you know, it's it's looking like inflation is going to be stickier for longer. We're hearing folks talk about the reflation trade, which I know you've got opinions about, Lance. Um, so my question is: is uh, are we going to need a, a, a new story? coming out of this to power stocks higher the way that, that we've gotten used to over the past year and a half? Or could we be looking at a more volatile market going forward where there isn't kind of like a, you know, a, a big dominant hope out there to drive things? No, I mean, look, the, the fundamentals haven't changed. Um, you know, earnings are still strong. Companies are still generating earnings. There's, you know, the, the economy is going to slow down. And that's, you know, earnings are going to come under some pressure. So will we continue to have this kind of nonstop advance that we saw in, you know, from November of last year till 
uh, this month, um, you know, it's it's going to be probably more of a of a normalized market. Um, if you take a look at the top of this chart, the MACD is is over is getting as close to being as oversold now as it was back in October, November of last year. And that's what I'm saying. We potentially have some more to go on this correction. And we did get we got below the 200 day moving average, uh, you know, last October as well. And that was where everybody's like, oh, I see the bear market's back. And then it just took off running. Right now, don't forget, you don't have corporate buybacks, corporate buybacks are blacked out. That's hundred percent of almost hundred percent of your net equity purchases for the market. They're blacked out. Uh, for the next two weeks as we go into earnings. Now, once earnings go out, that whole buyer comes back into the market and, and buybacks are going to continue to be a major player in driving asset prices higher. Liquidity flows are still high. Investor flows are still high. Foreign inflows are still strong. So again, the backdrop of liquidity to the overall market is still going to be there. That's that's not changing. Now, the, the one thing that you know, could change here is, you know, we did see a, a rather sharp drop in bank reserves as somebody I was tweeting out this morning. This is the first time that we've seen a sharp drop in bank reserves now in quite a while. Um, and again, this could be just a one-off anomaly. Um, it could be something, you know, more important, but I mean, we've seen these, we've seen these drops before. Uh, in fact, we saw one back, you know, uh, in, in kind of May of, uh, so this was kind of March of last year during the Silicon Valley bank crisis, we saw a drop, a similar drop in reserves and then reserves balanced and then started going back up again. And that was what was propelling the market higher. So this correction is running right along the correction in bank reserves. This is something the Fed's been paying attention to. Why the Fed keeps talking about cutting rates is to make sure the banks have plenty of liquidity. So, you know, the, the, uh, the reversal of rate hikes into rate cuts is if this will continue, rate cuts are going to come in July or August. Um, if not, maybe we see rate cuts towards the end of the year. It's also why they're talking about reversing the quantitative tightening back to quantitative easing to provide more liquidity to the banks. But this is your driver. Um, banks loan the money to the hedge funds, to the pension funds, et cetera, for leverage. That's where this comes from. And that's why bank reserves are important to the market. All right. And I'm going to steal the screen just for one second because sure. I had a similar chart here. Uh, so this is from Bloomberg, which is showing that um, the reserve impulse uh, is has gone negative um, and that that is serving as a short term headwind to stocks. Uh, so I just recorded an interview yesterday with Simon White from Bloomberg uh, about this. And um, he is basically saying that, uh, you know, th this is it's an important development that, yes, liquidity has been net rising. Liquidity has been driving uh you know, the, the action uh, mm -hmm. in a huge way, as we've talked a lot about. Um, and, and the fact that it's actually, you know, gone negative again here um, is is material. Now, there's a lot of factors that are still influencing liquidity, um, but this is an important one. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as we get to potentially the time period where the reverse repo program is drained and whatnot, and, and of course the BTFP uh, has stopped sopping up uh, uh, you know, uh, giving banks relief. Um, you know, th there there are a, kind of a number of pillars that have been propping up that rising liquidity that are now um, ending or reversing. Right, but again, e even that you know, don't read super negative into that, right? I mean, just because you have got a reversal in liquidity, yes, you're going to have a correction in asset prices because you're removing liquidity, but we're also removing liquidity through uh, corporate share buybacks as well. So you've got kind of this dual lever that's that's pushing on stock prices. But as you go back to your chart, there's been plenty of times we've gone negative on bank liquidity and we had five or 10 percent corrections. And that's complete, again, completely normal. Um, even during 2022, liquidity was whipping back and forth and you would have a sell off and then a massive rally. Then you have a sell off that was all blamed on the Fed, you know, not hiking rates or not cutting rates. Right. Um, and so, yeah, we did work our way down to 20 percent. But just because liquidity goes negative doesn't mean the world just falls apart. So, you know, it's very important to put context around these type of, of analysis. And if you're trying to spin a really bearish narrative, this sounds great. It's like, oh, my gosh, well, look at that. Bank reserves are going negative. You better get out of the stock market. It's all going to crash. That's been terrible advice. And it's been terrible advice for a long time. So it's understand it's important to understand that these dynamics do have a play on asset prices in the short term. But as you can see, 
this thing whips back and forth. So we may be negative for a month or two or three, go through a correction, and then, then that liquidity is going to turn back up and you know, asset prices are going to rise with it. Absolutely. It is a component. It is not the component. And again, even in the title here, you know, uh, Simon short was term. cautious to say short-term headwind, right? For yeah. exactly those reasons. Um, yeah, but, but I, I, I see, but see, and I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you brought that chart up because I probably got that chart 50 times since it's come okay. out. <laughs> Everybody's like, "Oh my gosh, you know, it's, the world's coming to an end," and it's like, "No, it's not. Just calm down." And this is look. This is the difference between people that make money in the markets and people that don't. Um, you know, you will not find any major wealthy investor that is, you know living their whole life thinking a crash is coming because you won't make any money that way. Most people that have a lot of money invested in the markets or in asset prices of any type, they're very optimistic long-term. You know, if you own real estate, you're optimistic long-term that, you know, the world's going to keep growing, economy's going to keep doing fine. If not, you're sitting in cash and you're not doing anything, right? So it's always important to measure you know, your analysis with what actually happens in the market. It's great. You know, this really bearish stuff is great for headlines. It, it gets views, it gets clicks, it scares the crap out of you. And then, so you don't do anything, right? And then the market takes off running without you. And you're like, yeah, but everybody said it was going to crash and it didn't crash. We've been hearing the market was going to crash since 2009, right? I mean, every time we turned around since 2009, the market was going to crash for one reason or the other. And it never occurred. I mean, you know, you can just go back and look at, you know, a lot of these guys that were pitching the crash of the world and it's just never happened. So uh, it, it's interesting. This is kind of getting to the, the, the rant that I'm hoping we have time to have today um, where, where um, I want to talk about hu humans. Are, we're pretty bad at assessing risk. Right. Um, we, 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 it, it's math that our, it doesn't come naturally to our brains. Right. We, we tend to really either overestimate it or underestimate it. Um, and uh there, there are there are times where I think it pays to be conservative, but you're drawing an important line, Lance, right? Which is, you can be conservative and cautious, um, but but not be you know petrified, right? So it doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? And I think even now you're saying, hey, this is a time to you know to go down a little bit further. You know, again, maybe hedging might not be the worst thing to do, um, but you got to remember that as you're saying, you know, uh, if you want to make money in the markets, you, you you've got to be you know, generally long something, right? And uh, and the people that have been more long than they've been more out of the market have done much better, right? right. And I kind of hearken this back to like caveman days, right? Which is we 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 have uh, innate um, risk aversion, right? Um, because there's lots of things out there that can kill you, right? You know, um, if you go out of the cave, it's a scary world out there, right? It's a dangerous world, but if you never went out of the cave, you know, you just starve, right? So, you know, humans humans have, I think, a, a, an overriding underlying sort of sense of optimism that says, despite the risks, I'm going to go out there and try to try to make my fortune in the world. And again, that's not to like a like a blind, you know, trust that everything's going to be, you know, sunshine and rainbows. But but net net, you know, if you want to improve your situation, you got to grab your spear and head out of the cave, right? Yeah, I mean, if that where you starved to death, one of the two. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah, it's my, my point. And, and so I, I, I kind of think of that often as you talk about, you know, the people that have scared themselves out of the market to the point where they can't get back in because the market takes off and then they fear like, you know, every time they're they're thinking of getting in, well, maybe I'm the last fool, the greatest fool buying in now. And so they just always talk themselves out of getting back in. Um, at, at the end of the day, I, I, I agree. And, and I probably am wired to maybe be a little bit... Um, more cautious than the average investor, but 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 I admit that I have to fight that 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 drive to always prioritize safety and and to take a calculated risk with downside protection. Yeah, yeah, no, and and, and you know that's that's very true. And there's there's always opportunities that occur, you know, even during crisis events. And and again, you look, we're going to have another crisis event at some point. I don't know what's going to cause it. Neither do you. Neither does anybody else. It's not going to be anything that anybody's talking about right now. It's not going to be Israel. It's not going to be Iran. It's not going to be Russia. It's not going to be the collapse of the dollar. It's not going to be any of that. It's not Taylor it's Swift. Not, it's not Taylor Swift, although, you know, she might be. I don't know. Um, when she's president, we'll talk about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the you know, you know, nobody saw the 
housing crisis coming to the point that it did, right? I mean, you go back and look at the mainstream media, there were a lot of people talking about subprime, but nobody really understood that issue and had it and what and the point about that was is that the trigger for that was the one thing that nobody saw which was the shuttering of lehman putting forcing lehman to bankruptcy nobody saw that coming and it didn't matter how you know like subprime's a problem yeah but had we not shut bank, bankrupted lehman and shut down the counterparty trading the markets would have probably worked their way through that subprime crisis. And, you know, we would have been a bear market for probably two or three years. Markets would have probably gone nowhere, but it wouldn't have been a 50 percent decline. It would probably been 20 and then a rally, then another 10 or 15 down, then another rally, that type of thing. It'd be a very different environment. But when we bankrupted Lehman, it just shuttered the whole market. And that's what the, the vast majority, about 60 percent of the entire decline occurred post Lehman. And so that's the thing that that will get you in the markets. And you can't prepare for that because you don't know that that's going to occur. And we just don't know that's going to happen until after the fact. So, you know, this and, and that's why it's important to be able to react to markets. But again, as we've talked about before, the markets are up 500 percent since the 2009 lows. So, yeah. Let's say you saw you. Let's say you were one of the the guys that you saw this whole thing coming. You got out of the market in two thousand and eight. Wonderful. You missed a fifty percent decline. You never got back into the market. I can tell you, there's people like this because I, I meet with them on a regular basis. They're still not in the market, and they've lost that five hundred percent return in the market. To yeah, they protected themselves from fifty percent decline, and they've missed five hundred percent coming out of that. So again, as we talked about before, sometimes you know trying to avoid the risk is worse for you than just going through it, right? Just go ahead and take the 50% decline. It ain't great, but long term, you're going to be better off than having to you know get out, avoid it, and then never getting back in. Okay. I uh, get the point you're making. I also just want to underscore, I don't think you're making the point, hey, don't have risk management. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm just saying it's like for a lot of people, though, that I meet with, they would have been better they off. They would have been better off. Yeah, I just not doing like anything. Just if they had just rode the crisis out, yeah, it'd be terrible. But they'd be better off today than they are because they never got back in. Right. right? That's, that's the point. That, that, that's yeah. the investor equivalent of our caveman who never left the cave. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So let, let's talk about earnings for a moment here because they yep. are beginning to come in. Um, yep. And I heard you say that it, that earnings continue to remain strong. Um, I, 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 you have to, yeah, that, I, that said with a caveat, by the way. OK, so so, so <laughs> it, 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 explain that. And then I want to talk briefly about Netflix. Well, I mean, basically, you know, when you're looking at the earnings, you have to remember that we've already cut guidance uh, a whole lot on earnings. So estimates have come down a lot. And so companies are coming in, they're meeting or beating estimates, but you got to remember those estimates were lowered a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, guidance That's is forward guidance. Yeah, forward guidance. We don't have enough in yet, really. The, you know, forward guidance has been a little bit negative. It's not overwhelming negative at, at this point. Um, what it's gonna, what's going to happen is, is that the current guidance is going to bring down the estimates for 2024 in total. So we're going to see the year end estimates for 2024 come down. Um, in which we expected that to happen anyway. But that's that's just the game. Anyway. That's the game. <laughs> that that's always the game. But you know, if just from this, and again, next week we're going to really get into the heart of it. So in the next two weeks, we're going to have about eighty percent of the S P five hundred reporting off Apple, Microsoft, etc. Nvidia doesn't report until I think towards the end of May. They're pretty. They're one of the last ones to report. So we won't get one of those seven, the Mag seven reporting. Um, but Netflix just came in. And you know they they had an interesting change in in their guidance that they're no longer going to be giving out sub numbers and 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 they made a very important distinction. They said you know we have enough free cash flow now we've got enough earnings and revenue. Subscriber growth is not the metric anymore. It was great when that was a great metric to use when we had no earnings or revenue, and so we were growing subscribers, which would hopefully generate someday revenue and growth for the company. We've now matured. And so that subscriber growth number is really not that important. Well, the market didn't like that because of like, well, <laughs> the market we, agrees. We've always that, yeah. used we've always used this fantasy number of subscribers to generate higher valuations. But I, I think it's I think it's a very important move for Netflix to be treated like a true operating company. I mean, we don't go to you know we don't go to Apple and go what were your subscriber numbers? You know, we say what did you earn? Right? You know, we don't go to Amazon and say what's your subscriber? You know, how many subscribers do you have? 
that's in there, but we look at we really look at the operating profit and revenue for the like Amazon's example. How much did their web services make, right? How much you know did their data centers put out? I don't know what were their sales. So again, you know, once you kind of reach a mature status, and this is my big beef with Meta, is that they still report how many users log on. Do you have any bots are on Meta? I mean, fake users, fake accounts, uh, accounts that people set up and then they've got multiples of them and they never actually log on to. I mean, there's so much phony, you know, data in that number. We shouldn't even be using that, right? What's the revenue? What's the growth? What's your expenses? You know, we should be evaluating companies for what they are. And so I think this is a really important change for Netflix, is my is my point. All right. And it sounds like you're you're supportive of it. I'm I'm maybe more mixed on it. Um I think when you are a media company, um, your audience size does matter. Um I totally get your point about meta having a lot of fake numbers, but 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 Netflix really doesn't. And, and your analogy about Apple, I mean, people do track iPhone shipments, right? Oh, yeah. Like they, yeah. And, 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 you know, everything on Netflix is pretty much based off of what's our ARPU, you know, what's, what's our average revenue per user or subscriber, right? I mean, and so that base is important. And Netflix, you know, used the term, hey, we've evolved. I think making the argument you made, but I think Wall, Wall Street, at least so far, is saying like, not that much, buddy. Because <laughs> their stock's I, I, down eight percent right now. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and look, Wall Street will get over that, and they'll it, it's just they're throwing kind of a tantrum at the moment. And again, this always happens. But if Netflix stays, you know, holds their guns on this, then Netflix will just be starting to be evaluated like a normal company. We'll look at revenue growth and all those type of things. But again, you know, what's you know what's the point of reporting subscriber growth, right? So first of all. If I have a bunch of subscribers that are free subscribers, I make no money off them. So that's fine. But if I can sign up for 30 days or 60 days, whatever it is for free, that doesn't really tell me much. What I want to know is, is if that subscriber is turned over into an actual subscriber who's now paying, well, that's going to be reflected in my revenue growth. So why do I need to worry about how many I have as long as my revenues are growing? And and that's and that's Netflix's point. We're we're a mature company. It doesn't matter if you know if I have a, a million subscribe new subscribers this month or five million. If they're all free, doesn't matter. I'm not making any money off those guys. How many did I convert to actual paying subscribers? And that number is going to show up in my revenue growth and my income yeah. growth. I, I think I think and, and I don't want to rat hole in this because look, I'm not a Netflix analyst, but I, I think this is maybe the difference between. You know, a snapshot of, of of results versus a discounted cash flow valuation yeah. over time. Which is, if I'm an investor, I want to know. I mean, I want to know how many free subscribers you have because I want to know how you're converting them to to paid. But I also want to know your your subscriber growth because let's say it turns negative, that's definitely going to impact my DCF for your company, right? Not I really. Think it's easier for not, Netflix. Not, no, no, hold on, that, that's not true. Because let's just say that I have a million subscribers, right? And they're all paying 10 bucks a month. And I get no more subscribers from here, right? So immediately, just overnight, nobody nobody new subscribes to Netflix. That's not going to impact my revenue growth because I have a million people paying 10 bucks a month. So if I want to increase my revenue, I can increase my rate. So the the, the point to you know, what you want to know is how many people, how many paying subscribers did I lose? That's what I was That's saying. That's the yeah. most important point, right? So it's not how many I get, it's how many I maintain. And how many I maintain is the actual important number, but that shows up in the revenue growth. Yeah, well, again, it, you know, generally your your subscriber, both free and paid, are inputs into the business results. And so how those things, how the others are trending are going to influence how I, you know, if I'm a Wall Street analyst, how I'm putting my projections and my models. And once that data gets removed to me, I feel like I'm flying a lot more blind because then I just have to say, well, okay, how did you grow your revenue over the past couple of quarters? I guess I got to assume you're going to have that, right? So anyways, um, uh, we'll see what it's going to it's it's be a Wall Street issue to come to deal with. So yeah. I'm not but anyways, long stock, so I've got no horse in this race. So. Yeah, not, and neither do I. Don't own Netflix, don't plan to. Um, all right, so um, let's see here. Still lots and lots to go through here. Um, Okay, real briefly, I, I want to get to a, a piece that you just wrote um, today, I believe, about, um, you titled it Economic Warning from the NFIB. 
um, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, um, which which tracks you know what's going on more on the smaller business side of things. Um, real quick before we do, I just wanted to talk super briefly about retail sales because you and I had a an offline text exchange around this when the numbers came out. They they came out for March um, <clears throat> and they were pretty good nominally. Um, I think it was zero point seven percent growth. Uh, that beat estimates, I think, of 0.3%. Um, they they also um, revised upwards the previous retail sales numbers um, such that uh, the February number was was higher than what came in for March. And I think you, you know, were, were less impressed by that than, than maybe Wall Street's initial reaction to it. And I think you said that for a couple of reasons. One, because it's it's a even though it was hot, it was it was growth. It was slower growth than before, and secondly, March kind of had a lot of good things going for it, and still couldn't beat the February growth number. So um, it had tax refunds in it. It had Easter getting pulled into March. Um, so, what are your current thoughts about what the retail sales numbers are telling us? Well, I'm trying to pull up a couple of charts here for you. Um, hold on a second. I got I've got too many things open. I can't find you. Okay. There you are. Uh, sure, sure. So yeah, so a couple of things were, is that if you take a look at the retail sales numbers, so this is advanced retail sales. And, you know, in, in February, so a couple of things that, that are going on, right? So in February, we had a, a stronger than expected number got revised up. What occurs in February that, that people spend a lot of money on? Valentine's Day, ring a bell? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yep. And if you're not out buying a $100 bouquet of flowers and going out to an expensive dinner and doing something, you're you're probably either single or getting divorced now. So, <laughs> so, so a lot of spending goes on around Valentine's Day. One of the bigger, one of the bigger event days of the year. I mean, Hallmark makes all their money for the year, I think, <laughs> on Valentine's Day. So normally then, so, so you had a bigger number in, in February, on the growth side than you had in March. But also remember, we're also coming after four straight months of decline. And so you had declining retail sales in October, November, December, and January, big drop off in January. Now, what happens in October, November, and December? Well, October is the second biggest shopping day of the year. That's Halloween. Then you've got Thanksgiving. Then you've got Christmas. And then you have New Year's. So you've got a tremendous amount of of spending that normally occurs around the busiest shopping days of the year that didn't occur this year. So what happens is twofold. One, and this is why economic, you've got to be really careful with economic data. Economic data, and the same thing with inflation data, same thing with any, any type of data, nothing goes straight down. You're going to get to a point economic. So if you're looking at the ISM index or you're looking at the Philly Fed or whatever, it's like, oh, Philly Fed was stronger than expected. So it means the economy is roaring. No, that's not what it means. What it means is, is that people ran out of stuff and inventory and they needed to order more stuff. Or if I'm at home and I'm not and I'm cutting back on everything, right, because I just you know, I'm trying to make ends meet. I eventually have to go buy something, right? I've got to go refill my fridge at some point. I've got to go buy some new clothes, whatever it is. So you're going to always get these bounces in economic data just from a cyclical standpoint of the consumption cycle. And whenever I have that consumption cycle occur, it's going to feed through the entire system. So if I'm buying gadgets or whatever it is for Christmas, then the producers of that good or service is going to show an uptick because I bought it from them. So these economic indicators are all going to bounce, even if they're still in decline. Same thing with inflation. So you're going to see these upticks in activity that occur. And again, we try to read all this stuff into one month. But OK, so let's talk about February again. Had a stronger month in February. You had Valentine's Day. In March, we pulled forward Easter into March. So now you've got spring break which lasts for three weeks around the country because everybody's got different spring breaks because you've got you know kids, everybody, families, whatever, going on vacation, going skiing, whatever they're going to do on spring break. So it's a lot of travel and it's a lot of buying stuff, right? I gotta, if I'm going to the beach, I got to go buy a new bikini or a bathing suit, whatever it is. I'm going skiing. I need a new outfit to go skiing, whatever it is. Lots of, of spending around that spring break cycle. Then you had Easter, which is a big travel day. 
And it's also a big, big expenditure, right? So we're spending a bunch of money on Easter, going out to eat whatever we're doing. So you had two big holidays all in March and you had weaker retail sales than you had in February. So again, it wasn't really impressive. And if you just take a look at retail sales over the last year, they're not doing much, right? I mean, they, I are, ask pretty, about that. Yeah. they are pretty weak really across the board uh, when you take a look at retail sales. And again, we can kind of look at this in a different way. I mean, here's your giant spike you had in, this is nominal, so this is not inflation adjusted, but there's your giant spike in nominal retail sales because of what's going on. But what's important to, to note is, is that retail sales tell you very little about recessions. If you go back and look at 2000, retail sales were positive and doing well, heading in, and actually held up well all through the recession. There wasn't a big drawdown in retail sales during the recession. In 2008, 2007, 2008, it gave you a pretty decent signal. Retail sales collapsed during 2008 because people were losing their jobs left and right because of the, of the financial crisis. So not surprising, we saw a big drop in retail sales. And heading into 2020, we had a big drop in retail sales, but then they took off again. So really didn't tell you a whole lot about what was really happening in the economy overall. So again, it's just... You know, that's kind of the thing. This is just a this is advanced real retail sales. So this is inflation adjusted. Um, I, I've done it. On a, on a, we don't have the actual uh, inflation print for real retail sales just yet. So I had to do a, I had to do an estimate for inflation for the uh, for the March number. I think I'm pretty close. Um, but again, you know, we're basically at about the normal, you know, kind of bottom end of retail sales going all the way back through history. I mean, this is this is not a level that we should all be excited about, about how strong the economy is and how strong the consumer is doing. It doesn't suggest that at all. It suggests that they're barely struggling to make ends meet. Is, is this one of your reasons why you, I mean, I know it's multifactorial, but you, you expect economic growth to slow. Absolutely. Year, is part Absolutely. Of this, and relatively it, anemic consumer retail spending. 40% of PC, so GDP, is almost 70% comprised. It's like 68.5% personal consumption expenditures. Retail sales is 40% of that 68 and a half. It's, it's a big number. So, you know, yeah, you cannot sustain stronger economic growth and higher inflation with retail sales that look like that. Okay. Um, I just want to read real quickly um, an exchange I had with Neely Taminga, who folks may remember I interviewed on this channel a few weeks back. She is a consumer retail analyst. Um, she had said she was going to be watching the March numbers really closely. Um, she, I asked her what she thought. Here's what she said. She said, um, I'd say March came generally in line with our expectations. As you know, we were calling out all the positive forces that would influence the number. Tax refunds were higher, Easter shift, easier comparisons, et cetera. She says the re reverse occurs in April. April is likely to not look pretty. More people have to cut uh, taxes owed checks versus last year because of the delayed effect of California's IRS due date last year, and Easter is no longer in the month. She said May might be one of the cleaner months to observe true underlining trends on, on an apples to apples basis. So mm -hmm. it seems like, you know, to that point, let's see what happens in April. It's probably going to disappoint a little bit. May will tell us, should be a better barometer really of where the consumer is headed. Yeah. And you, look, you just saw a big money market drawdown of people taking money out of money market accounts to pay tax bills. Yep. Yep. So I think it was, uh, I can't remember the stat. I can't remember the stat, but it was like the biggest money market drawdown since, I don't know, the GFC or something like that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So let's get to your point, your, your piece here on the NIFB. Um, what what data is making you think there's a warning that's being issued here by well, our, our mid to small company fleet? Well, and again, you know, it's just a, it's this is something that nobody really pays much attention to. And in the in the financial media, it doesn't get a lot of press coverage. And, you know, I get it. You know, it's not really exciting data by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, it's important to remember that the small businesses comprise 50 percent ish of the entire employment in the country. So they're very important economically, and they spend a lot of money on capital expenditures. They spend a lot of money on you know buying products, goods, and services from other businesses. So it's a very important component to the overall economy. So if you kind of want to know where the economy is going, the NFIB report's actually been a really good indicator of that. So the NFIB report just came out um, week before last, 
And it fell to the lowest level since 11 years since 11 years ago. I mean, we're going back to the credit crisis um, in terms of where we are right now. We've already broken below the, the 2020 pandemic low. So they're even more bearish now than they were back during the pandemic. Um, and again, there's there's a, a lot of correlation to this um, uh, around a variety of things. You know, first of all, you know, the rise in interest rates is weighing on their ability to refinance debt. The one thing that small businesses don't have access to is the corporate bond market. So they can't, if they need to raise debt like a, a publicly traded company, they can't run to the bond market and go issue, you know, a, a $5 billion debt instrument to whatever fund their, right. their, fund their business. I mean, they're they stuck. To beg, they have to beg the bank. Yeah. Yeah. They, they beg the bank or they have to pull it out of cash or they got to go borrow it privately, et cetera. But what you'll notice is, is that whenever there's an uh, in the five, when the ever the deviation of interest rates from the five year average of interest rates spikes up, that normally occurs with a big decline in activity. And of course, then after that, interest rates fall below the five year average because it's following economic activity. So, um, you know, you'll you'll notice that whenever that uptick occurs, it, it very quickly shows up into activity of small businesses, which ultimately you know shows up in the economy. Um, and to your point, they've got to go beg their bank. The problem is the banks aren't loaning them money, right? So I'm going to the bank saying, hey, I'd really like to borrow some money. And the bank's going, yeah, I don't think so. Um, not in this environment where we are right now. So bank lending standards have gotten right, a lot right. higher. Or, or, or it's just, yeah, you can borrow, but it's it's really expensive and you're going to have to cut costs elsewhere. Yeah. Well, yeah, and even, but but my point is even if they're willing to pay higher rates, the banks don't want to loan it to them, right? Mm -hmm. So bank lending standards have just gotten a lot tighter. Um, but so this has a big, so there's several economic warnings to pay attention to that come out of that NFIB report, which is capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are an input into the GDP equation. And capital expenditures are dropping very sharply right now, because if I don't have strong, now let's, there's, there, these economic warnings all relate to the same item, which is if I'm a business owner, and if you own a business, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. If you, if you have a business and you don't have any customers, what, what, what's going on with your business, right? Are you hiring people? Are you spending money to go build out property, plant, and equipment, buying inventory, whatever it is? If there's no, if the, if the demand is falling off, in other words, shoppers aren't coming to your store, you're not going to be expanding your business. And so we're watching that right now with capital expenditures. And they're cutting capital expenditures because of their less economic outlook. This is CapEx plans tied to real gross domestic investment. So, when you look at GDP, part of that equation is gross private investment. So this is inflation adjusted. So we take a look at CapEx plans. There's a very high correlation between those CapEx plans and what happens with real gross private investment. Right now, investment in that number, that real gross private investment is elevated, but yet we've got a very sharp leading drop off in those CapEx plans, which suggests that real gross private investment is about to start slowing down in the next you know, few quarters. Same thing goes with, the, and, and if we overlay real gross private investment with gross domestic product, you see the same thing. So as goes private investment, so goes the economy because they're linked. And again, as with everything we've talked about before, whether it's interest rates, inflation, economic growth, et cetera, they're all linked together. So once you're seeing what businesses are telling you, the, 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 this is CapEx plans versus real GDP, that correlation is going to reassert itself most likely in the next few quarters, unless, unless the current uptick in economic growth is this miraculous recovery in the economy, and all of a sudden there's a massive surge of demand to businesses that have them revert all of their ideas. But this isn't just one month of data. This, this decline in CapEx plans has been going on here for quite a while. So if we take a look at, so moving on to the next economic, so CapEx is one, that's economic warning number one. Number two is sales and cost of labor. And so uh, the NFIB does their, what they call their top three concerns. And they have a whole list of concerns. Are you concerned about the cost of labor? Are you concerned about inflation? Because they're about taxes, government regulation. They ask them all these questions. So if we take a look at things that directly affect businesses, right? So are you selling stuff, right? Or is, or you have good sales or bad sales? Um, the cost of labor is that way, because the cost of labor is the most expensive item of any business is, is employing somebody. 
So what's going on with your cost of labor? And is this a good time to expand, right? If, if, if my business is booming, I'm going to be like trying to open another store, right? Let's say I'm a, I'm a retail store and, and I sell widgets and business is booming. I'm going to go open a widget store across town, right? I want to try to get that, you know, side of, of town, whatever it is. All of these indicators suggest that things are getting worse, not better. And, you know, that's that's the real kind of rub here is that their concerns are rising because the one thing they all depend on is if I'm not selling a good product or service, I'm not making any revenue. And so we look at uh, what they, the, the NFIB produces two reports about sales. What do you expect over the next three months? Do you expect sales to be better or worse? Now, as I've told you, business owners are always optimistic. And so when they look forward in the next three months, it's like, well, last quarter really sucked, but I think things are going to be better. So or at least I'm hoping they're going to be better, right? And so there's always, historically, there's always been a pretty big gap between the orange line at the top, which is expectations, and the blue line at the bottom. In other words, their expectations are always above what actually happens, but you know that's what it is. So the black line is just an average of the two. What you'll notice is right now is those are all sitting right on top of each other. Their, their expectations now match reality, and it ain't good. We're at, we're at some of the lowest levels in sales and expectation of sales. And again, this is 50% of your economy making retail sales. Is at some of the lowest levels we've seen since 2008 during the financial crisis and during 2020. And so if we take a look at av that, so let's take that black line. That's the average of expected in retail sales. And I've overlaid that with real retail sales. You mean to tell me if you look at that chart, that tells you that the economy is booming. So right. nothing, nothing. No. To, and, and this is why, you know, so if I don't have sales, I'm not going to do CapEx. And if I'm not doing CapEx, I'm not employing people. And so if you'll notice, we've seen a very, very rapid decline in the, in the percentage of businesses that are expecting to increase employment. And that's not surprising. And what's interesting is, is there was this big, everybody was focusing on small businesses intent to hire. And it was very interesting because this graph was coming out like every month, you know, the, during, you know, coming out of 20 joys, like, look at small businesses. They're just going crazy trying right. to hire people. But yet the black line at the bottom is what they actually did. So when they were taking the survey, it's like, well, oh, you know, Adam, are you planning on hiring anybody? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to be hiring some people because, man, this economy is just going crazy. But did you hire anybody last month? Well, I hired one. Yeah. You know, big difference. Well, now all of a sudden that expectation is declining rapidly. And I suspect that we're going to get back to a fairly close correlation. Also goes to show you about what's happening with workers comp, big drop and what's happening with workmen's comp. And if you'll notice, there's a very high historical correlation when economic comp drops or workers comp drops. I mean, sorry, not economic. When workers comp drops, so does economic growth, obviously, because I don't have any money to spend. And, and so all of this is starting to really wind up into this whole production cycle. It's great that we're a consumption-based economy, 68, over 68%, almost 70% of our economy is consumption-based, but I have to produce first in order to get a paycheck, in order to go buy stuff, which creates economic activity, which gets businesses to hire more people, to produce more product, increases wages, creates more demand, which requires more people to produce stuff. And that's the virtuous cycle of economic growth. What the NFIB is telling you right now is that is going in reverse, not in the right direction. All right. So um, I don't know if you have any charts that specifically speak to this, but it's intimated, I think, by a lot of these charts, which is, all right, look, if I'm, if I'm going to be making fewer capital investments in the future, if I'm going to be not raising workers' comp as much, um, presumably... They're thinking about maybe even shrinking their workforces to save yep. costs, especially as one of their top concerns is the cost of, of employees, and they're worried about sales, right? right. Um, as you mentioned, I, I think I think it's more like sixty percent of jobs are provided by the small to medium businesses. Um, so uh, it's a lot. Know, it's a lot. Uh, and then also <laughs> the next topic we're going to talk about is is, is rising um, rising rates and stickier inflation. Right, which is the, the longer we're at higher for longer inflation and cost of debt, mm -hmm. the worse the situation gets for these guys. Right. So, what's your general level of expectation about 
um, the potential for for job losses going forward in this cohort? Well, so remember, so first of all, they never hired like they said they were going to, right? So expectations were well ahead of actual hiring. And that's because businesses are very cost conscious at the end of the day, right? I have so much revenue. I've got to make a profit. I need but to when, you're, when you're small, you can't labor hoard as much because you just can't afford to. Yeah. Right. And, and the same thing occurs, though. It, what's important here is, is that they are going to hang on to their labor that they have as long as possible. So when as economic activity slows, you know, the small businesses, they're not quick to go lay off all their staff because, first of all, they don't have a lot of staff. A vast majority of the businesses in the U.S. have less than 10 employees. So if I lay off one person, it's a tenth of my staff. Right. But, so, but, I mean, but this this is kind of my point. If they all yeah. decide just to say, look, I'll just get rid of one. It's 10 <laughs> well, percent of the remember, workforce gone. A big chunk of them have only have five or fewer employees. Right. So but, and, and then, then, a then lot of these businesses, percent reduction. right. Right. And some of these businesses, it's just you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, <laughs> so the, the point is, so, you know, yes, you know, this is why when we look at jobless claims and, and those type of things, they really don't tell us the real state of the economy, because again, there's a lot of kind of guesstimation that goes on with the jobless claims numbers, who files, who doesn't, are they reporting, you know, that type of issue. Uh, and we focus on the big companies, right? Oh, Apple laid off 10,000 people, or that's not a good example because they didn't do that. Tesla just laid off 10% of their workforce. Okay, there's it it a lot of people, right? Because it's a big company, they off a lot of people, it gets a headline. You know, they laid off 10%. Again, I lay off one in my my business of 10, 10 employees, right? That's the same 10%, right? It just doesn't show up in the data the same way, mm -hmm. right? So we are going to see jobless claims rise and we are going to see unemployment start to rise. But we're already seeing this. You take, again, I just did that whole report last week on, on illegal immigration and how it's boosting employment numbers right now. But you take a look at the number of full-time jobs versus part-time jobs, full-time employment as a percentage of the population, that's dropping markedly already. It's telling you that the that these businesses are already cutting staff. It just hasn't showed up in the the the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics data and the way that they account for things. Okay. Um, and this is one of those things, again, you know, folks have been watching this channel. No surprise that that I and you and many folks are watching employment like a hawk. Because mm -hmm. really, where that goes goes the future of of the economy. Mm -hmm. um, but but you know, I've talked about how the unemployment rate. I'll try to see if I can pull up a chart here before we're done. Um, sure. That uh, it, it's one of those things where it, it it it's pretty low and steady right up until we hit the next recession, yeah. and then it just <laughs> falls higher, right? Yeah. And um, you and I have talked a lot about the the skepticism that we have for a lot of the official jobs data, um, and it, it's just this is one of those things that I think could get out of hand, go from good to bad way faster than most folks expect. And, and right now, everyone's conditioned that like, hey, we've thrown everything at this economy from higher interest rates to QT to, you know, whatever. And nothing, nothing matters to employment. It just stays low. We've got this permanent low plateau of, of you know, Happy Valley uh, uh, unemployment forever. And, and I think that you know, sets them up for a nasty surprise when, when and if we get to this point. Yeah, and no, and we will. Uh, you know, look, there is no doubt that we are going to have a recession someday. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just part of the economic cycle. It's going to happen now, whether it happens next month or next year or five years from now, that's the hard part. We just don't know that. We don't know what's going to eventually cause that trigger to occur that creates this sudden revulsion by businesses to just lay off a bunch of workers. And again, you know, we go back to you can't, 2020 is not a good example of a recession because we force people to, to lay off people. I was like, you're out of business. We're shutting down the economy. Go home. Um, so that 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 right there, that's a really poor example of that. But if we go back to and to your point, you know, you go back to any point in history. What unemployment tells you is, again, what I was saying a second ago, is that corporations are really, really reluctant to, to let people go. And so something has to happen that all of a sudden companies are across the board go, yeah, we got it. We got to immediately cut and we've got to get people. You know, we've gotten too staff. You know, we got too much staff. We got to cut back. You know what's happening, whatever, whatever reason, you know, you go back to the financial crisis you know, that, you know, we didn't, again, and also you have to be careful here. You know, one of the important things to understand about this data is 
is that every one of those recession marks, we didn't even know we were in a recession until after the fact. So, you know, the way to look at unemployment is to take off the recessions for a moment and say, look, unemployment was rising. And that was telling us there was a problem economically. And then all of a sudden it starts to really accelerate. About six months after the fact or nine months, the National Bureau of Economic Research will come out and say, oh, yeah, the recession started there. Yeah, so, over, over here, they'll tell you, oh, yeah, you were in a recession yeah, back here. Right. Yeah. And so, so when you look at this, it says, oh, yeah, so as soon as that, that unemployment spikes, you're in a recession. You won't know that until after the fact. But if you take a look at what's happening with the unemployment rate, it is creeping up, right? It has bottomed. It is starting to slowly creep up here, kind of like was doing in, in pre-2000. Uh, pre-2000, if you go back to look at pre-2000, it was just kind of slowly starting to creep up a bit. And then, you know, you had Enron and WorldCom and, the, you know, the wheels came off the cart. So we're we're starting to see some of that early evidence that the economy is really starting to slow down. All right. Well, look, folks, we'll just, you know, continue to keep our eye on this. Um, but but this could very well be one of the canaries in the coal mine there. Um, but it, all right. I, let me but just throw out my word of caution, right? This doesn't mean go sell everything and go jump yep. off the cliff because, again, this could take six months. It'd be another year. It could be two years from now. I mean, the timing is the difficult part. The timing is the difficult part. And, and, and look, um, I mean, I think they more often than not, they they are correlated. Um, but but recession doesn't always mean horrific market crash either. Right. Now, given today's valuations, personally, I think you know there, <laughs> there there could very well likely be a correlation. But we could have a slow grind into recession um, that that leads to a slow bleed in in markets, right? I mean, so to, to Lance's point, um, whether we go into you know if we go into recession, it it it, it may not be a sell at the everything event, right? It, it it might be there might be air pockets in there, but the the point is is you know the the time honored uh disciplines that that Lance you know talks about week after week on on this channel will generally serve you um very well versus a hey I saw a headline it made me scared I'm going fully to cash <laughs> and then you know yeah and we beat that yeah. horse plenty enough this time around exactly yeah just 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 manage risk that's it okay so um all right a a another risk um so let's let's talk about bond yields um okay. so bond yields continuing to go up um, uh, I, I think, I don't know what they've done since the, the Israeli attack on Iran last night. Um, but, uh, as of before the attack yesterday, uh, the 10 year was at like 4.65%, I believe. So, um, just, just do an exercise with me for a moment, Lance. Um, mm -hmm. so let's say that inflation proves more intractable and, and let's say that the fed, um, its hands do get tied this year. And it, it really can't do any rate cuts this year, it decides, okay. right? Um, what does higher for longer in terms of, of today's interest rates mean for the economy? You well, know, if they're applied for another, you know, for the rest of the year into next year. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, this, so the, I, I'm actually writing an article on this for this weekend's newsletter. So it, I'll have all the relevant charts and graphs in this weekend's newsletter. Somebody just got bingo on their bingo card. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's a hot topic right now, right? So uh, most importantly, what I'm talking about is that uh, Jerome Powell just made a speech um, this past week, which he said, he said, look, he said, um, you know, we may have to keep rates where they are for a while longer because we don't have confidence yet that inflation is returning back to 2%, but we're confident that they will. It's just gonna take more time to get there. And there's there was no indication anywhere. I got a bunch of emails this week. One of the things that sparked the, the uh, newsletter topic was I got a bunch of emails from UBS going, the Fed's got to raise, high, uh, raise rates to 6.5%. No, they're not. And Jerome Powell made no inclination that he was going to raise rates any further. They're still on the side of cutting rates here. They just may have to hold them here at five and a half or longer. And that just means that lag effect of higher rates. And, th and this has been my question, right? I've been asked, I asked you this question a couple of times. I think last year I've asked Mike Leibowitz this question. I'm like, why would the Fed cut rates with employment near record lows with, you know, the, the stock market booming? Why cut rates? You've got the wind at your back. Just hold rates at five and a half percent. Wait for the wheels to come off the cart and then cut. Right. 
and use that to help buoy the markets and buoy the economy when you do it. Why would you cut early? And finally, the Fed is now starting to come back around and, and realize that that's your, their best case scenario is just kind of sit and wait, let the work do its job. And this lag effect of a lot of data is going to catch up. And you're going to have, and again, NFIB shows this as well, is that interest rates, inflation, economic growth are all going to turn uh, over the next few months. Okay. Um, so I mentioned I was interviewing Simon White from Bloomberg uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. and, and and he is just dumbfounded about Powell's December policy pivot. It was just like, why would he do that? I mean, you were yes. you were kind of getting everything in the direction you wanted to go. Why would you suddenly give the market the expectation of exactly what it wants, which which essentially had the effect, you know, kind of of, of rate cuts on the system and everything got a lot looser. And you just set yourself back, right? Yeah. Well, so. and again, I, it's, I think Mike is right about this. Is and Mike's contention has been that it's a function of liquidity in the markets. And what the Fed doesn't want is they don't want another Lehman event of some sort. Uh, so if it, look, they they have four hundred PhDs running around their halls of the of the Federal Reserve. They are not, you know, stupid people, um, and they have access to a ton of data that we don't have. So if they're looking at data that suggests there is a liquidity issue on the horizon, that may explain why they've been trying to drop this narrative that they're going to cut rates, trying to provide some additional liquidity to the market. Maybe that's the case. I don't know, right? I don't know the answer. They have their reasons, um, but that's the only reason that really makes some sense that they're concerned about some liquidity issue. All right, so let, let's play this out. So you may remember you were away the week that 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 happened and so mike took your place on this yep. this video and and we talked about hey is is the fed really as confident as they're projecting or are they are they fearful of of you know what you're talking about there and um i've asked that question to a lot of people in fact i actually even asked it to to thomas Hennig, the uh former sitting member voting member of the fomc and and his answer was probably a little bit of both right um, and maybe you can say, okay, maybe in the smart category, maybe they were, and because their job owning sort of acted as, as as rate cuts, maybe it served to stave off for a period of time the pressure that they were afraid of. Who knows, right? Um, on the negative side, it's created, well, potentially created issues for them again on getting inflation down on their main mandate. And now they got to kind of reverse course and disappoint the markets, uh, and you know, go higher for longer, which you know, weighs on the economy as we're talking about. So who knows, but uh, it, it'll be interesting to see, but but game this out for me. So let's just say that that we stay here at, at these higher level of rates. Um, you know, I, 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 I've overused the term lag effect, but like, do, do you become increasingly concerned that uh, the gravitational effect of these higher rates really begins to to pull things down and that the, the longer things stay here, presumably the longer whatever lag effect they're going to have is going to last. Well, the, the problem is, is that inflation is not going to stay where it is, right? And so inflation is going to come down more rapidly than the Fed thinks right now. Okay. Um, I, I and, just want to underscore this so you can talk to it in your answer. Yeah. Half the people I talk to disagree with you there. So I, I know that you're you quite can, you, can dis you, you can disagree with me all you want. The data tells you that. Okay. I just, so, I, yeah. So just in, in your answer, explain to people why your read of the data is the way that it is. Well, no, it's not even my read of the data. It's just the data. So let me ask you, let me ask you a mathematical question. You have two items, right, that make up an index. One is 10% of the index. One is 90% of the index. The 10% item moves a whole bunch, and the 90% doesn't. What happens to the index? Well, it depends on the relative moves, but the 90% is obviously going to have the bigger effect. On, on the on the index, right? On the index, yeah. So inflation is forty four percent shelter. Yep. So energy makes up seven percent of the index. So and and food and and that makes up about fourteen percent. So you have a very small percentage of the things that are moving higher in inflationary cost right now, and the effect of housing alone. And this is CPI shelter and CPI excluding shelter. Shelter prices are way ahead of the game here, and they're running a lag effect of about nine months. And so that's going to take a little bit more time to, to slip through um, into the inflation data. So coming up, 
uh, in the next few months, that inflation data is going to go forward. So here's the shelter um, rate change in nine months forward. Do you see that big green line? That's where your inflation's headed. Okay. And you cannot, uh, and it doesn't matter what you think. That's the math, right? That is just a function of math. You can, you can, you can come up with all these excuses. Well, oil prices are going to the moon. They could. They make up seven percent of the index. If housing and shelter are falling, and that's forty-four percent, oil can go to the moon, and it's not going to impact the rate of change in what's happening in the inflation index. And if, and and look, you can just take a look at the the very high correlation between uh, shelter and the forward expectations of rent. And then here's the rents post first annual and kind. So this is from Redfin. This year we are changing the median ask of rents. And here's the, the data in the notional rent index from apartment.com. And you right now have a massive overbuild of multifamily units. So you've got, a, you've got an oversupply of multifamily units out there that's going to lead to decreased rents, which is all going to show up in the housing index. So you can disagree with me all day long. That's just the math. Okay. Um, so let's, let's assume that- You can assume what you want. Math. Right. Yeah, you can yeah. come up hey, with assumptions. And, and I'm I personally okay. am not pushing against you. I'm just okay. I'm just noting that I interview a lot of people and, and this is the one they're the most in disagreement on. And it's roughly about half on one side, roughly about half on the other. Yeah. You've got Lacey Hunt and you know Steve Henke and other long-term smart, successful economists on your side. So that, that's definitely a good vote of favor in what you're saying. To my question though, so let's let you said there's sort of a nine month lag with, with with housing so you tell me but 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 let, let's assume it's not until the end of the year when people start changing their opinion on on sticky inflation right mm -hmm. uh, my point is just the longer we hang out here doesn't isn't that building a lag effect of its yeah, own that even even if inflation goes down nominal inflation goes down we may have a year or plus of the lag effect from everything that's been done that's pulling economic growth down during that period. Correct, yes, absolutely. The longer that you stay here, the worse the economic impact is gonna be. Because again, you're already seeing it, right? You're already seeing it in retail sales. You're already seeing what's going on in, in other economic data on the consumption side. You hear it in the polls, right? I mean, you know, the number of people that are going to the polls in November to vote, they're, they're, you know, they're barely making ends meet. So the more they cut and curtail consumption because they simply don't have money to spend because of high prices, the worse it's going to get, yeah. right? So, 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 here, it's, 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 so you get a big feedback loop around the whole thing. The longer you stay here, the bigger your deflation is going to wind up being. Okay. So what, what I'm trying to do in this conversation is not have you, Lance, say, Adam, you're always too bearish, right? Um, which is- <laughs> Adam, uh, you're too bearish all the time. <laughs> yeah. No, because- um, you know, you can still have the conversation with folks where they say, well, that's what you're talking about. Everything's great, right? I mean, retail sales are not, not too, I mean, they're not bad. Look, I mean, the growth, right? right? I mean, they, they, they can say, look, retail sales are good. GDP yeah. is growth. Unemployment is down. Companies are beating profits. Yeah, the market's a little wobbly right now, but come on, we're at 5,000, you know, we're still around 5,000, yeah. right? So, um, so, you know, you can definitely say, you know, Ed Yardini style, you bear so worried about right um and but right. I, I i share your concerns and it's not a prediction necessarily but it's it's i, I think that there are um there, there's good probability that the slogging is going to get harder going forward economically from here uh the thing that i worry the most about is job losses and i agree with you and we talk all the time about sort of the wealth disparity and the the, the prospects of folks I worry about that. And, and that's why I ask about this lag effect, because the longer we stay out here, I think the odds of, of marching into that future get higher and higher over the next couple of years. Yeah. But again, let's be really let's be really clear, because you are always super bearish. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes, this all suggests that the economy is going to slow down, that that things are going to occur. And I and I don't disagree with that. I'm I'm certainly in your camp on that, right? Because that's going to impact earnings growth. That's going to impact stock valuations. It's going to impact a whole variety of things. But that doesn't mean a that the world comes to an end and I'll be in a bunker with beanie weenies and completely and, agree. Right? Uh, it just means that yeah, we could go through a period where we have a fifteen or twenty percent correction in the market, which 
will be an opportunity at some point as the economy does bottom and as as you know the Fed comes in and look, let's just talk about what's going to happen. So let's assume Adam's right and tomorrow the world ends. So come on, man. That's, that's what you what just said. said. You just I'm, te I'm teasing you. I'm te <laughs> but let's just assume tomorrow. Uh, let's just you know assume tomorrow we wake up and the headline reads U.S. in recession. What's going to happen? Immediately, the Fed's going to step in and start doing QE of one, you know, 150 billion dollars a month or some obscene number. They're going to immediately cut rates to zero. It won't be 50 point slugs. It'll be one point slugs all the way down to zero. Um, you know, the government will probably try to launch, and it doesn't matter who's president, whether it's Biden or Trump or whoever, whoever's in, who's ever in power is probably going to try to do some type of government stimulus program. That's the new playbook, right, for the government to try to get things out of a, a, of a recessionary cycle. And that's going to turn right around and boost stocks. So, you know, we could very well be in this environment where we have a lot more of the 2020 type events where the market collapses very quickly by 20 or 30 percent. And then you're off to the next bull market. Right. So, you know, that's that's my point is that we can't extract from this this new reality that we're in that you know, every decline is going to be met by massive monetary and fiscal interventions. So uh, I, I don't disagree with that, and I, Lance. I think you and I see the future, you know, actually quite similarly. Um, what I'm trying to just make people aware of, of the potential for, and I think we agree on this, is, yeah, I think that's probably exactly what's going to happen, right? And so what you need to be positioning, for pre preparing for the possibility of is, uh, a weakening economy. Um, and so, yeah, that may bring stock prices down. Let's, let's use your 15 to 20%, right? So just, just be aware that that could happen. Um, more importantly, if you work for a paycheck, just be open to the potential that you might not have a job during that period, right? That companies might lay off, right? If you've got, you know, adult children that are launching into the world, they may be launching into a really tough environment to get hired in. And we're already hearing that. I mean, that's... it. it, it no matter what the, the BLS numbers say about how great this job market is, that is the narrative I'm hearing from almost every parent out there right now of college students, because I have kids of that age. Yeah. Um, so, and that, so do I, trust me. So do I. And we and, and I have this same conversation with our kids on a regular basis. Yeah. So if 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 the, the we get the response that, that you think and I think we will uh, from the governments. Yeah, that's probably going to goose um, financial assets you know, pretty quickly again there. So you don't want to just be totally out of the market and, and miss all that. At the same time, that's going to increase the wealth inequality issues that we have. Um, yeah. One, I don't think it's necessarily going to stimulate the economy as much as it will. That's a TBD debate for later on, Lance, but but you, we might still get on that, you know, diminishing returns of, of all this stuff and highly likely to restoke inflation and, and the, the ramp up in the cost of living. And so these are just all things that I, I talk about, not to say that, hey, the world's ending and everybody, you know, go in the bunker. It's just to say there's there are scenarios where the sledding could get a lot rockier and rougher uh, over the next couple of years. And I just want to make sure that folks are keeping an eye an eye to that and thinking today, OK, if that were to happen, am I positioning myself such that I've got the ability to react to that? No, I think no. You're absolutely right, and I think that's a, a very valid and important point because, you know, this is, and and again, what's our job, right, as investors? And our job as investors is to make sure we're growing our wealth over time. And this is why it's important to be prudent. And again, you know, I'm not about you know just saying just you know ignore all the risk and just let the whole thing wash over you. But, you know, again, it's important to kind of keep perspective on things so we don't do so we don't make decisions that wind up damaging ourselves and, and our ability to build wealth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to this chart I showed you a little bit earlier, Adam. Pull it uh, up and I'm just going to underscore as you do to say totally agree with you. And again, folks, that's why I say work with a professional financial advisor, because most people, Lance, don't have the experience, the interest or in many ways, like the, the mental fortitude to to make it through rough times like that when things are super confusing we we just default to whatever our emotions are, are forcing on us we make a ton of bad decisions yeah so and it's and, and and you know we've been through some tough times right so this is just the s p going back to 1992 um and, and what's interesting is is that let's take you know we, we've talked about the financial statistics in america right 
Um, the average household has about $100,000 in their 401k plan. The you know, average of $500 in savings in the bank. And what's important, to, to why those numbers are important is because, you know, if they were just buying and, you know, buying stocks, investing just an S&P index fund, if they were just invest into an S&P index fund, and, and regardless of all the big declines that we've had, they would be so much better off. But the reason that 80% of people don't have any money in the bank is because they're always making the wrong decisions. And not just from an investing standpoint, you know, they're, they're, they're living for, you know, YOLO, right? You know, you only live once. So I'm just going to spend all my money today and go into debt. I don't save enough. I don't invest enough. You know, we can just, you know, you and I have been through the litany of everything that, that people do wrong when it comes to their money. But we've had three major bull markets and the bull market we've been in since 2009 dwarfs all of them. And yet you still have the same financial statistics. And this is, and again, this goes back to, you know, the, the, the bad decisions that people make over and over and over again, saying, oh, the market's going to crash. I don't want to be in it. I'm trying to, you know, and this is loss aversion is one of the big nine of psychological behaviors that, that, you know, mess investors up is not having good risk management, trying to avoid, you know, be all in or be all out. And, you know, there's very clear trends to the market that, you know, make it very easy to invest and not worry about some of, the, you know, kind of turn off, as we said before, kind of turn off the media because the media is trying to get headlines. They're trying to get clicks and views and everything else. Focus on what matters. And that's the trend of the market. That's the trend of the economic data. That's the trend of the earnings data. If earnings data is improving, the market's going to go higher. If earnings data is declining, the market's going to go lower. It's, it's that It really is just that simple. But we get so wrapped up in all this other stuff, we just make repeatedly bad mistakes over and over again. And we've missed, most people have missed three major bull markets trying to avoid those two little declines, which weren't right. so big. They were 50% declines. But in context, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I absolutely do. Okay, well, look, um, I'm looking at the time and uh, I am worried we may not have time for the rant today. Let's go, and let's go right to your rant. Let's just go there. No, because you had another rant from last week. I'm remembering that you wanted to talk about too. No, no. Well, th 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 we'll do it you next time. We have more time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, but I, I just wanted, to, just real quick, I just wanted to, I, I get a lot of emails from your viewers. 25 years old, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, scared to death of the market and those type of things. So I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time next week and go, okay, let's, let's go through that scenario. You're 25 to 35 years of age, no kids or one kid. You know, what should you be doing? Let's we'll we'll do that next week. Cause again, it's it, you're not ready for a financial advisor yet. you you need you need another set of skills in place first before you get ready for a financial advisor. But we'll talk about that next week. We'll make that next week and I'll bump that up. I won't make it the rant at the end. We'll we'll make it part of the meat of the sandwich next time. It, yeah, um, it's, it's not really it's because it's not a rant, it's thoughtful money, right? It's yeah. it's let's we're gonna Help well, I mean, look, the, de the definition of our rants is a very broad one, uh, <laughs> a lot of positive stuff in those. Um, but uh, I, 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 that's great for a whole variety of reasons. I mean, I, I, I see the leads that go over you guys. You do have a lot of people in, in that cohort, um, but also a lot of the viewers here are older, but they've got adult children that are launching into the world. And that's a great conversation for for their kids as well. Right. Um, OK, so uh, but I'd get hung, Lance, if, if I didn't ask you your trades, what trades, if any, did you guys make over the past week? Um, starting to do a little, we're doing a little bit of selling, a little bit of buying uh, at the same time. Um, so, so we sold, so we sold our position in UNH um, after their earnings this past week. Uh, stock had a nice little pop. The stock hasn't really been performing well, and there's a lot of concern about Medicare. And of course, a lot of seniors now are starting to push forward their their operations. You know, hip replacements, knee replacements, that type of stuff, which is weighing on their costs. So, um, went ahead and, and kind of stepped out of UNH. We like that company a lot. We'll probably come back to it after the election. Um, once there's some clarity around Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, um, that type of stuff after the election, we'll probably come back to UNH because long term, we really like the company, but it's just not been performing well. Uh, so we took those proceeds and we added a bit to Palo Alto Networks, which after their earnings announcement last time, the stock had about a 26% correction. We bought a little bit of a starter position there. We added to that one. It's still a very small percentage of the portfolio, but 
Um, long term, we think you know cybersecurity is going to continue to be a very important part of our lives. Um, also part of the whole AI you know, situation as we go forward in, in the future. We also added to our Eli Lilly position we had bought previously. Um, we bought a, a, a kind of a beginning position there. Uh, Eli Lilly's been going through a very nice consolidation process, kind of got oversold. So we've added to that position, this whole new move to you know, GLP ones and everything else. Um, that's a, a new trend that's probably gonna continue here for, for some time. We'll see, we're gonna keep a watch on that. But, um, you know, so that was kind of a replacement a bit for the position. We, we sold more UNH than we added, but so we did a net reduction. And then uh, we also um, had, we also owned in our dividend equity model, we own 3M, which spun off their healthcare uh, division. And so we received that dividend and some shares of stock. So we sold those shares on receiving those um, and just kept the 3M side of the business because we needed the basic materials. Um, and we're also adding uh, a, a starter position in the equity model and genuine parts. So our thesis is that the economy is going to slow down. This, this cost of higher living, et cetera, is going to lead to more people hanging on their cars for longer, having to do more of their own maintenance. Mm -hmm. And genuine uh, parts just had a very nice earnings announcement and their earnings are doing really well. So we've added a very small starter position to that. We're looking for a pullback to build out that position. Okay. Okay. Um, and I should have asked this earlier when we were looking at the S and P charts. Um, mm -hmm. What will you be looking at uh, to give you kind of the all clear that the correction is over? I know. I know you think that there's going to be, you know, some short term movement to the upside just because we've just had downdraft yeah. after downdraft. But what's what's going to what's going to what would you want to see technically to say? Okay, I think this thing is played out. Well, you're going to need new highs for that. Um, you know, so, you know, that's going to be the challenge here for a while is that we could very well get a rally here. So we'll, we'll get a MACD buy signal at some point. The market's going to rally. You'll get a MACD buy signal. Uh, you'll push above the 50, maybe even go above the 20. But you're not out of the woods yet until you set a new high. And that's why, you know, you've got to kind of manage through this. So as we go through this correctional process, we'll likely work our way down, you know, ultimately towards the 200-day moving average. So on a rally, we'll probably short against our, you know, shorten our portfolio against some of our long positions, reduce our risk by shorting. We love our companies. There's probably, we're kind of, we're kind of in a bad position um, with our portfolio because all of our companies are doing really, really well. And we really like them long-term, Costco, et cetera. And we're actually looking uh, to add back into these positions. So like, for instance, back in February, we trimmed off our AMD and NVIDIA, took profits in those two positions. So now we're, we're kind of getting a little antsy around the tooth here to start buying back into those, those positions and bring those back up to weight. So there's so we're kind of in a position where it's hard for us to sell positions because they're all doing well. So we'll probably hedge against the, the portfolio by just adding a short position at some point. And then once the market kind of trends begin to turn positive. We'll remove the hedge and let the portfolio run again. Okay. Um, I, I just want to go back to your point about, you know, telling people to, Hey, come up with your shopping list, determine what you want to buy. Cause you might get some better, like, what is the buying strategy there? Is it just to keep nibbling as prices go down and, and valuations get better and better? Or is there some, presumably you're not going to wait necessarily until all highs to start buying. Maybe right, you'll ramp yeah. up your buying once you're you do. too late. Yeah, yeah. Right. You're too late for that. No, you, you've got to be willing to step in at lower prices. Look, you know, what's the, the very basic premise of investing is to sell high and buy low, right? So, you know, we sold AMD and NVIDIA right near the highs. And, you know, that was tough to do because we, you know, it was like at that time, these things were just never going to stop going up, right? So we stepped in, we took those profits. Now the hard part is buying them while they're going down because yeah, they could keep going down more. So, you know, this is this is the the challenge as investors is to go against the grain of what emotionally we're trying to we're oh, I don't want to lose any money. That's okay. If it's a good quality company in the right space, and if I can buy it at a cheaper price, nibble into it a bit. Yeah, you may buy like genuine uh, parts, right? We're buying it here. Just had an ounce an earnings announcement. Stock had a nice move. Um, it's overbought right now, right? Technically, you wouldn't want to buy the stock here, but historically, this stock has a tendency after earnings to kind of keep climbing higher. So we bought a little bit here, and when it pulls back, we'll have a loss in that position, but when it pulls back, we'll add to it, bring our dollar cost averaging down, 
And then as the stock starts to go up again, then we'll start adding into it on the way up. And so we'll build that dollar cost average position over time so that we can kind of build a, a good cost basis for that position in the portfolio. And that's what we've done for a lot of our companies is that we've, you know, all the companies that we own, we've bought and sold them multiple times. Not, or not all of them. We don't sell everything and then buy it back. But, you know, we sell a little bit here and then we add back to it later and we sell a little bit there. I mean, we've owned Costco since 2019. The stock's up a tremendous amount. But if you look at our portfolio, we're only up like 64% in the position. And that's because we've been buying and selling it and, and changing our cost basis along the way. But we would sell it, take profits, the stock would correct, we'd buy it back cheaper, and then the stock would rally again. So if you actually look at our net return on that position, it's over 100, it's like 150% on that one position in the portfolio. It just doesn't reflect that way because we keep changing our cost basis. All right. Thanks for explaining that. I think it's really sure. helpful for people to figure out how to navigate this. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip over the ramp. Uh, we've gone long here. Um, I, there, there's, I'm just going to share this one image uh, that I put on Twitter, um, and Lance will just laugh about it for 20 seconds here. <laughs> um, but um, you know, as we get into this, uh, you know, potentially tougher economic times, and certainly a greater and greater swath of the country is is expressing that their their incomes are not keeping up with inflation. Um, you get tone deaf articles like this that come out about, you know, the 1% that just doesn't have any worries like this. And it really does, Lance, seem like they live in a different universe. So uh, here's an article from, uh, I think, the Wall Street Journal uh, that just got uh, made its way around Twitter. Um, for folks that that are on the podcast and not, not seeing this, it's a beautiful, beautifully decorated house. Um, the headline is, they love their $14.95 million Hamptons house. The problem their dog hates it. I was uh, a little worried there because I thought that was my living room for a second. Oh, really? so. <laughs> <laughs> so it says this couple built their dream home in Sag Harbor, but, Harbor, but they're now selling it because their golden doodle Rufus, quote, gets pouty while he's there. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, this, as I said in my tweet, this is why people just hate the coastal elites. Right. They, they just seem so out of touch that their their big challenges in life is that they're expensive breeder pets. Uh, you know, aren't in a state of euphoria uh, when when they go out to the uh, uh, you know the vacation home, right? The 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 gazillion dollar vacation home. I, I just have a real question: Is does the dog really hate the house, or is there something else going on there that the dog hates? Oh my God! The speculation that that has erupted in Twitter after I put I can, this out. I can, about only, which I, can, really... I can only imagine. I can yeah. only imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's safe to say uh, that it is not it is not the dog's attitude uh, that's the root cause there. Um, but still, it's just uh, it's just ridiculous. Um, all right, folks, we'll look, um, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, look, if 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 you get pouty every week, you don't listen to this weekly market recap between Lance and I. Uh, please vote your support for us continuing this uh, by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below. I think Lance has done a great job today of helping you know folks understand how to think through, how to navigate the current period we're in in the markets and what might come ahead. Um, as I've said many, many times, uh, I think the vast majority of people should be working under the guidance of a good professional uh, financial advisor to navigate all this. My one real key uh, caveat versus just being a good professional financial advisor is that they take into account all of the macro issues that Lance and I talk about here. Very few do in practice. Um, so anyways, if you've got a good one who's doing that for you, great, stick with them. If you don't, or you'd like a second opinion from when it does, maybe even Lance and his team there at RIA, consider scheduling a consultation with the financial advisors that Thoughtful Money endorses by going to thoughtfulmoney.com and filling out the form there. Um, and do this, folks, you know, only if you're really serious about how you safeguard your wealth going forward from here. Uh, these advisors are very busy. They've got plenty of people to talk to, plenty of, of, of things that they need to devote attention to. But I think that this should be one of the top most important things on your list. So if it is, make sure you go and schedule those consultations. Uh, as always, Lance, it's been phenomenal. I'll give you the last word here. Uh, no, uh, look, you know, the, the important thing here is there's a lot of things happening in the markets. And look, we're, we're in the process of this correction that we've been talking about for a while. But there's a lot of, you know, real, this is where emotions start getting out of control. We start worrying about, you know, things that probably won't happen. And you start making your rational decisions like, oh, my gosh, I've just got to sell everything and get out now before it goes down anymore. Just calm down, take a breath, let the market, the market is going to rally here. It's not going to go straight down. 
So if you're really stressing out here, I get it, right? We all do it. I do it. You know, nobody likes markets going down. We, it's easy when it goes up, but wait for a rally and then sell into the rally. You'll feel better about it. And it's better for your portfolio to do it that way. All right. Well said, my friend. Thanks so much for another week. Everybody yep. else, thanks so much for watching.